My name is Roy Parker, Extension Entomologist, and we welcome those that are at the remote sites. I need to also tell you folks at the remote sites, we'll hold your questions or write them down till the end. It'll be better for us as far as trying to get this done in a timely fashion. Dr. Charles Suh graduated from North Carolina State University in 1999, studying under some people, the one of which I knew, Van Dyne with a degree in entomology and a minor in crop science, which goes to the other good. He was subsequently hired by USDA, ARS, and College Station specifically to work on boll weevil research or do research on the boll weevil. But it so happened that the program started about that time, and so he was switched to other work for a while until problems persisted in our South Texas eradication programs. Both Charles and I are on the Texas Bow Weaver Eradication Technical Advisory Committee, and we are also both are on the National, the National Cotton Council uh, Technical Bow Weaver Eradication Technical Advisory Committee, primarily with Mexico uh, and the United States, but Texas is the big part of that. Uh, this seminar today. Uh, the title, which is Problems, Challenges, and Potential Solutions for Completing Bow Weaver Eradication in the Lower Rio Grande Valley. And just a moment ago, we were talking about those solutions, and we emphasized potential. So, Charles, I'm going to turn it over to you, and maybe you've got some things that we can finish up with. I will tell you from a personal standpoint, he's one of the few people that's still doing any work on bow weaver eradication, specifically to help our program uh, finish up in, in the United States. Charles. Thank you, Roy. It's a privilege to be here. My last time and only time I've been here was back in 2010. I came to visit Mike, picked him up, and took him down to one of my trapping studies down here in the lower Rio Grande Valley. So yeah, he, he, he'll see some familiar pictures in here. Uh, I'd like to start with first giving you a little background info about the boll weevils. I don't know how many of you are, have been involved. I didn't know what your audience was going to be like, so I just want to give four quick facts about the boll weevil, and I want you to keep these in mind because they're going to be important as we go through the talk. The first is this insect is native to a subtropical area, Mexico, Central America. It's a subtropical insect we're dealing with. But it can overwinter and survive host-free periods, uh, which allows it to overwinter. When you plant cotton the next year, it emerges, it's ready to feed again. In fact, we fattened some weevils up in our lab I don't know, back in 06, and we had one that lived w over a year without feeding. So they can survive a long period. Also, they primarily feed wild cottons, cultivated cottons. There are some other plants they've been uh, shown to feed on. Whether they, uh, how well they survive is really not known. Uh, the last key is the male produces a pheromone that's attractive to both sexes. So keep those facts in mind. Well, the boll weevil was first detected near Brownsville in 1892, and about every year it spread across, uh, moving about 40 to 160 miles each year. And by the 1920s, it had already reached North Carolina, pretty much decimated the whole cotton industry, as you can imagine, as it moved across the belt. Finally, they had some calcium arsenate back in those times. They were able to keep it in check, control. Um, by late 1960s, they identified and synthesized the pheromone. And with that pheromone, they felt they had the tools now to eradicate the weevil. And so there was an experiment conducted in Mississippi, 50 counties wide. Um, you look at fall dry paw spray, they just wanted to reduce the overwintering populations. They used mass trapping, uh, trap crops, and they also released uh, sterile insects back then. Well, they, unfortunately, they ran out of funding after their second year. It was, it was supposed to be a three-year project. They ran out of funding, but it was a huge success. So they sought additional funding, and then by 1978, they set up a trial in North Carolina and Virginia. Again, they use, here they used methylparathion, guthion, to control the overwintering population. They also released sterile males, and they also used the mass trapping and uh, trap crops. 
Well, after three years, it was a tremendous success. And then by the 85 or so, they had completely eliminated the weevil from their area. Well, given that success, all these other states started to follow suit. And we started to see the birth of the national efforts there in the 80s. Um, by 1990s, 2000s, we moved to all the other states. So now we had a program pretty much throughout all U.S. production areas. Well, so by 2009, we're left with just populations here in Texas, northern Blackland, southern, upper coastal, south Texas, then down to Rio Grande, and then parts of Mexico. Well, next year in 2010, they made tremendous progress in the northern Blacklands, virtually didn't catch any weevils there. Same in the upper coastal bend area. And over the last three years, we've made tremendous progress in the southern Blacklands. And these are the captures in 2010, and the greens are in 2012. So you can see we're, we're, we were down to two weevils captured last year in the southern Blacklands. Uh, here in the South Texas Winter Garden area, uh, only 38 total last year. So we made tremendous progress there. But if you look back down here at the lower Rio Grande Valley, those numbers have been actually increased from 2010 to 2011 and stayed in that 200,000 range. Uh, so for 2013, these are proposed zones, um, northern Blacklands, all these four zones here are proposed to be uh, functionally, or suppressed, I should say, and really the only active area we have now is the lower Rio Grande Valley. And we're talking about 10 counties here, but the majority of that cotton is produced in these three counties, uh, Hidalgo, Willacy, and Cameron counties down here. In fact, I just attended the producers' meeting last week, and I believe they said in the zero acreage in Zapata. So I, I think pretty much all the cotton is going to be in those three counties. Well, some of you may recall the program actually started there back in 1995, but they had some severe secondary, I see Craig shaking his head, outbreaks there the following in. And whether the eradication was the cause of that, it's debatable. I'm not going to say one way or the other, but the producers decided to shut down the program. They just lost too much cotton uh, from those outbreaks. Well, the program resumed uh, back in 2005 with their diapause sprays, and currently the assessment fee now is $28 for irrigated, $14 for dry land. Uh, like I said, they made tremendous progress during their first four years there up to 2009, but by 2010, the progress has been pretty stagnant. Uh, to go quickly over some of their trapping protocol. Uh, traps are spaced about a tenth of a mile around the perimeter of all fields. In about 2010, they also started trapping the corners of fields that were previously planted in cotton. And, uh, and that's going to play a big role later in these slides I show you. Uh, baited with a kill strip, 10 milligram pheromone lure, and the traps are checked weekly. Uh, lures replaced every two weeks, kill strips replaced every four weeks. They use these traps, obviously, to trigger treatments. Uh, when they started back in 2006 to 2008, two boll weevils per 40 acres triggered a treatment. Um, 2009, that went down to one weevil per field. And 2010 to now, uh, same as that, one, that one weevil per field, but they're also treating within a quarter mile radius, cotton fields within a quarter mile radius of that trap that triggered. We look at the cotton acreage over the years, it's, one thing you'll get is fluctuated tremendously over the years. Um, this year, 2013, they have 86,000 acres planted, but a lot of that has already been zeroed out. They're expecting to harvest maybe 25,000 acres uh, this year. Uh, if you look at the catcher, again, tremendous progress during those first four years. I almost got it down. I mean, 37,000 weevils, tremendous progress from starting at 3 million. But again, 2010, 2011, population came back up, and it's been uh, about at that level. Uh, if you look at the acreage treated, starting back from 2000. 
2007, which is this back line, red, and then green, 2008. You see that the number of acres treated really hasn't changed that much. Even with the fluctuations in acreage planted, they seem to have to treat about the same amount of acreage. But Roy asked me if there was any good news, and there is. Uh, if you look at this map, you see the lighter gray. These are all cotton fields, yellow. Uh, the bars indicate catchers, actual numbers. I don't know if you can see the scale here. But if you can see this gray area, there are a lot of fields that didn't catch a single weevil last year. And if you notice, most of the problem, or the highest catchers, are south of the expressway 83, just along the river. So that's, that's where most of the problem is. They've done a good job cleaning uh, up, up the northern part of the zone. Well, what are the major problems and challenges of complete eradication in that area? Well, there's several, actually many, but I want to concentrate on three today. And I, I picked these three because some of the research we're doing, uh, we're doing a lot of research at ARS to address some of these issues. Uh, the first is, again, you've got a subtropical climate, so you've got year-round presence of volunteer and regrowth cotton. Also, the program heavily relies on these traps to trigger their treatments. So there have been instances where they're finding weevils in fields, but the traps are showing zeros. Uh, so we, we, we need to minimize those detection failures. Also, having access to the fields or traps a problem, as well as treating those fields. And then the third one I want to talk about is the border safety issue and cotton production in Tamaulipas, what's going on in that area, or essentially our neighbor. Well, we not only have plants, we have cotton trees in the valley. Uh, this is, in fact, someone's yard downtown, Wesleco. Nice bowls. I wonder what kind of yield they get out of that tree. Uh, here's one. This was actually removed in the parking lot of a restaurant in Wesleco. And they counted the rings on it, five rings. It was a five-year-old tree just sitting there in the middle of downtown in the parking lot. And, you know, a lot of times, a lot of these plants, when they're taking their, all their modules off, you get a lot of seed cotton being blown off. In fact, I was down there back in 2010. I got a call to say, hey, come look at this. And I was in Harlingen under an overpass railroad track. There was a dish there with some water, and it was just loaded with cotton plants where they had blown off the overpass, seeded rock. Some of those were two-year-old plants. Uh, a lot of those had been chopped off by the railroad guys as they mowed along the area, but they came right back up. And they were infested with weevils as well. Here's a flood wave there in the Lower E. Grand Valley. Uh, you can see all these cotton plants that germinated along the water line. And these guys are having to go out there, handpick and remove all these plants. But you can tell how big these plants were before the, anyone even caught them. Nightmare scenario for eradication. This is a producer had cotton in this field and then abandoned it for two years. So this two years removed from cotton. Had a bunch of seed out there, didn't know about. Whenever they got some rain, some plants germinated, then you ended up with this all across acres of fields like this. Probably their biggest, one of the biggest issues with volunteers is the growth of plants and other crops. And I, I don't know if you can see this, but if you all the way down this whole row are cotton plants about that size. And the biggest problem is oftentimes they don't even know they're there until they harvest that field. And th this was actually a picture with my area, the southern blacklands, and when they're wrapping up the program there, we point out, so look, you've got this issue. And that's when we really started working on looking at survival on these regrowth plants. You know, how well do they survive on these plants? Um, but it, it, oftentimes they're not even detected until that field's harvested. There's more a little obvious situation, but I, I want you to notice the date on this, September 25th, where their destruction deadline is September 1st. And this is first year sugar cane, planted sugar cane. They watered it up and all these seeds germinated uh, in that sugar cane field. 
And like I said, a lot of times you have this situation. You have taller plants, you have cotton plants hidden in those plants that, that you don't even know about. Uh, Two-year sugarcane. Again, look at this date, September 24th. It was 24, I mean, September 1st is their deadline for getting rid of plants, and yet you've got literally a tree, and, and you don't get the perspective here, but for hundreds of yards down this field, there are plants like this all along down the side of this field. So well, why is crop destruction so important? Well, Noel Troxclair did a study back in the Uvalde area, and it, it, here's the situation. You have these two plants on the border of two different producers' fields, and, and one producer thought, well, the plants belong to him. The other producer thought, no, the plants belong to that person, so they just left them there didn't get rid of them. Well, Noel came in there, collected all the fruit off the ground, and then he took those two plants back to the lab and removed all the fruit, sorted them out, and he classified them. He looked at fruit that had egg punctures, weevil egg punctures, feeding injury, no injury, or had evidence of weevil already emerging out of it. And the number I want you to concentrate, so he had 96 weevils that emerged in the field, or had evidence that they'd already emerged out in the field. And of the 258 squares and bowls that had egg punctures, he got 153 adults out of those fruit. So he had a total of 249 weevils come off just two plants at the end of the season. Now if you assume half of those 249 weevils are females, and each female can lay 100 to 300 eggs in their lifetime. Uh, that's a potential of 12,500 to 37 and a half, or 37,500 eggs uh, that could be produced from weevils coming off those two plants. So what's the scope of the problem? In the, we, I just showed you two plants. Well, in 2012, after their top destruction deadline, they had over 17,000 acres with hostable plants after harvest. Um, total of 33,000 had to be treated. Now that means some of those fields got multiple treatments, uh, but still, that's 17,000 acres of hostable. That's a field, I mean, we, we, we do, I just showed you what two plants could do. Just imagine having acres and acres of plants. Uh, since January 1st until April 30th, captured 87 weevils around commercial cotton fields. These are around the, the traps that they place, place around actually uh, cotton fields that were planted this year. But 35 of those weevils came from a field that had voluntary regrowth issues back in 2012. What about non-commercial? These, these are plants, crops that have cotton in them. Um, it's really, the acreage is a moving target because some weeks, some fields are coming into compliance. Other weeks, they're just detecting volunteer plants in those fields. So it's, the acreage is always moving, but their highest week's acreage uh, with hostable plants was uh, close to 6,000 acres. So th th these are cotton plants inside a cornfield, for example. Uh, they had to treat a total of over 13,000 acres uh, of those plants for weevils. Uh, now remember, we caught 87 weevils in traps around cotton fields. They've captured over a thousand weevils in traps that are around the non-commercial, the corn fields that were that had cotton the year before, or the milo fields that had cotton the year before. So these non-commercial fields are just a nursery for weevils. And in fact, when they harvest a corn a tropical corn variety back in February. They got a huge flush of weevils come out of that field. They caught 184 weevils in traps around that one cornfield. Well, we also talk about trap detection failures. Uh, I'm glad to see Daryl's here because that's really where I started my research. When I started getting back into bull weevil research, it was to address some of their trap detection failures there in Medina County. And, and you're probably going to recognize the field here I bring up. Uh, and then again, there's impediments to timely trap access and malathion application. That's one thing for your traps to trigger treatment. It's another thing to be able to get out there and spray it in a timely manner. Well, what 
factors influence weevil's temperatures. Well, we know temperature has, you have to have warm enough temperature for weevil flight, but temperature also influences the rate of pheromone emitted from those lures. Same with wind speed, you know, uh, in high winds, weevils can't fly very well, but that wind speed also influences your pheromone plume, the shape. Um, competition from pheromone producing weevils. We know once in the spring, we start to, when overwinter weevils are starting to emerge, you catch a lot of weevils in the trap, but once those plants start squaring and you have weevils find them, starting to produce pheromone, they outcompete the traps. And then that's what we term, often call trap shutdowns. You don't catch anything in your traps because you've got a lot more pheromone being produced out in the field by weevils that are tracking weevils straight to the field. We also know trap placement makes a difference. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, lure quality, you've got to have a good lure. The program uses a 10 milligram or lure dose with 10 milligrams of grand lure. And one of the things, first things we looked at when you guys were having problems there in Medina was lure quality. And we, we uh, th this just gives you some idea of this. This is what probably a standard lure should look like size-wise, but you can see the variation we were getting in size. Uh, just from a package, from one single package of lures. Uh, when we weighed those, you see this bimodal distribution. So you had nearly 27% weighed this, and then but you had a bunch of lures that were this weight, same thing. And then also we had a big gap, and then we had a bunch of large lures. And so what we ended up with, the pheromone dose was actually 7 to 12, 12 milligrams. I mean, it's supposed to be 10 milligrams, but we had this huge range. And I can tell you, and we'll see here a little bit later, just imagine if you start with a seven milligram lure, what happens. So we looked at the lures from these three companies. These are the three companies that supply lures to the eradication program. And each year they, they put in a bid, try to get the contract to supply the lures. You know, we never thought, well, a 10 milligram from Hercon is the same from 10 milligram Plato. Well, we found that's not the case. And especially with Sentry too. So, so we looked at the amount of pheromone released from these lures every day at a constant temperature of 85 degrees. And what we see for all three brands is you see this tremendous initial burst of pheromone that first day, but then it tails off that second day, and then it really tails off here. And then by seven days out to 14 days, you have very little pheromone being released from those lures. Same thing, we looked at field age lures. These are lures we actually put in traps and held them out in the field and removed them every uh, so many days. Um, the average temp daily temperature for this trial was 89 degrees, so pretty hot. Uh, again, if you look at the first six days of that lure's life and see how much pheromones released compared to the last six days, see that very little pheromones being released that second week. And one of the recommendations we made to Larry for your areas was, hey, you may want to change these lures out weekly instead of bi-weekly, especially in some of these trouble areas. Um, again, to give you some perspective of that, I, I broke that down to this is the average amount daily pheromone released during those same time periods. And I want to point out this 0.17 milligrams per day. Well. A one bull weevil can produce that amount in 24 hours. So you can imagine if you have 40 weevils in your field cranking out that much, they're going to outcompete your traps. So it doesn't take much. So we've got to figure out some way to get this second week lure. Besides having to replace these things out weekly, we've got to figure out a way to have a more uniform release. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Again, trap access is a problem in the area. Not so much from rain, uh, but there's a lot of irrigation. Areas get flooded, one side of the field, they can't get to their traps. Well, if you can't get to your traps, you can't check them. You can't trigger a treatment without access to those traps. And then we have environmental in interferences. Whenever I need to go collect infested squares, the first place I'm going to look is under a power line or right next to the wood edge where that applicator can't get coverage. Um, here, this was back in 2010 when they had that huge uh, tropical storm and depressions all, all during the summer. This is the site you guys are probably familiar with. Um, well, 
they can't treat these with airplanes. They have to come in with their ground applicators. Now, I, I did hear one year, this year there was a pilot that was actually brave enough to fly through those. Uh, fortunately, most of that's dry land. The acreage where those turbines are dry land. So for the most part, they're able to get out there when they need to with their ground sprayers. But those turbines are becoming an increasing problem. And, and this, th these little pinkish lines indicate where they're located in that area. And the green are actually cotton fields. Well, this scenario is only going to get worse through the years. There's more and more turbines going up in that area. So, so that's going to be a challenge to get, get timely treatments in those fields. What Roy failed to mention is I interviewed down at Wessel Cove, and they actually offered me a position back in 2000. But when I interviewed, I remember getting off the plane and it just wind blew all day long. We went out to eat, wind was blowing. Went back to my hotel and I thought, this would drive me crazy. There's no way I could work down here. Well, this is the wind chart. Now keep in mind the eradication program, they can't spray if it's over 10 miles an hour. Well, I don't know if you can see these numbers, but if you look, this is April 1st through the 30th, from 7 o'clock through 8 o'clock. And all those red areas are times when they couldn't treat. The only times they could treat were during these white blocks. Now you've got 100,000 acres you need to treat and you've only got 15 hours to get it off. Well, it's not going to get done. So, so that's, that's the problem. And the wind is a big challenge in that area. And this was back in 2010, uh, June 25th through July 19th, here are the times. Again, the yellow indicates when times were actually below 10 miles when they could go out there and treat. Uh, the blue blocks indicate rain events. Again, very few periods of time when they're able to get out there and actually treat. And then, in fact, we had nine days here where they got their treatments on, but then they had a rain event. So you had nine days to wash off. So in actuality, about July 16th and 17th, this time period here, about the only time they had quality applications on their fields. But this is the time where about every field south of that expressway is triggering uh, because, you know, they're starting to foliate this time. Uh, crops are starting to cut out. So their catchers are going up. So, but you only have a limited time to treat all those fields. Uh, the last one I want to talk about is cotton production in Tamaulipas border safety. We all know the situation down there along the border. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to go down there, but there's this nice border wall we've built down there along uh, the border. Uh, we all know the problems, the violence, the drugs, issues going on uh, along that border. There's a failed smuggling operation. This guy got high centered up on the fence, on the fence trying to go across. Um, but in 2012, we got the fence here in red. We had over 4,000 acres of cotton between that fence on the U.S. side and the river. Mike, when you went down with me in 2010, we had a trap line study right here and some traps here on between the river and this fence. What Mike didn't get to experience, because the first three weeks I was down there, I got stopped by Homeland Security every time. As soon as I crossed that fence, they would just appear. Um, I never felt, you know, in danger just because I knew Homeland was right there. But there have been times when the program's been in there and Homeland's asked them, it's time for you to leave now. So they may not be able to check some of those fields uh, when they need to. So what about cotton production, Tom Alipas? Well, this, this is a little older chart. Um, this, these red areas indicate current infestations, but I, I'm going to say last year a lot of these areas were cleaned out or they didn't catch a single weevil. The only immediate area is here in Tom Alipas. And if you look at the cotton acres over the last five years or so, in fact, in 2009, they didn't even grow cotton. You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, we can solve the problem, we just don't grow cotton there. Well, they didn't have cotton in 2009, but they still had weevil problems the next year. Uh, now, we, here in 2013, uh, they had 3,000 acres planted. Uh, they're down to about 2,800 acres, but all of that's irrigated now. 
give you some perspective of the distance. Uh, we're, you know, most of these, these little black blocks are all cotton fields there in Tamaulipas last year. Most of the majority of those fields are, are 15 miles from the border. Um, it's just essentially the other side of the county for you guys. It would just be the other side of the county. Well, they do have a program, an eradication program. And in fact, they started theirs back in a year earlier than the Lower Rio Grande. Um, it's trap-based just like ours. They trap every ten, uh, 100 meters, 80 to 100 meters. But they also use bait sticks. I don't know if you guys are familiar with bait sticks. Um, and, and they use what's called border habitat treatments. And instead of treating the cotton, they actually treat the outside of the cotton fields along the dish banks, the overwintering areas. When plants aren't even there, they're just treating the overwintering habitats. Um, it's federally state supported, but the producers are, are also pay a cost. And uh, unlike our producers here where, where we pay an assessment fee, the producers only have to pay for the application cost, but that poses a problem because you can imagine if I'm a producer and they're spraying my field about the fifth time, I, I don't want them. To, I don't want to have to pay for that fifth application when they're not spraying the other guy's field. So there have been instances where uh, they think some of the producers have removed the weevils, so that it wouldn't trigger a uh, application. Uh, the other issue is funding there. You know, they do have state and federal uh, government support, but the money only allows for about four applications a year, and that's based on about 5,000 acres of cotton down there. And also, I mean, they have problems with the cartels, especially access to some of their fields. The cartels will dictate which fields they can go in this week or can't go into. Uh, it may be two weeks before they can get into that field. Uh, if you look at the average weekly captures uh, over the years, you see, you know, we've, we're we in the red. We've made tremendous progress down there, but then, again, you know, we sort of remain stagnant here. But if you look at the Tamaulipas program in green, they actually started with pretty low numbers, but for the last three years, their numbers have gone up. And, and again, back in 2009, you know, so, well, they didn't even have cotton, yet they had weevils the next year. Uh, Again, this gives you some perspective of the weevil captures and, and relative distance of fields. Uh, here we have the Tamaulipas, and, and each of these bar represents a single, the total number of weevils captured in that field. Uh, as you can see, the highest bars are here in Tamaulipas. Uh, I mean, we have some high bars here in, in, along the river, but for the most part, uh, a lot more weevils over there than here. I threw this in there. This is actually looking at the captures in the Lower Rio Grande Valley. And, and what I wanted to point out here in 2011, you, you see this huge spike got back down. And we see it spike again. And I think what's happening there when we have these, and we see this commonly in years from year to year, is when we have a flush of weevils coming, they're about a month ahead of us or so. And so when they're, they're harvesting, we, we, we get a flush of weevils. So, so I think that's why we see this spike initially. And then when we're getting rid of our plants, we, we, we see the spike coming out of the Lower Rio Grande. But make no mistake, when they see these spikes, I bet you know our weevils are going down there as well. So uh, if they were to keep trapping afterwards, they'd probably see a spike as well. Uh, you know, one of the issues is uh, volunteer and regrowth cotton. We talked about the Lower Rio Grande. But the other programs in those other states in Mexico also indicated it's a huge program. Roy and Craig, you know how many meetings we've been to where they say that's not an issue in Tamaulipas. We don't have regrowth. We don't have volunteer. Yet all the other programs in Mexico have admitted that's a huge problem for us. Uh, why, why it's not an issue there, I, I don't know. But no one wants to go down there to actually look. That's the problem. So how, how, how do we resolve this issue? Well, the first thing, we, we, we just have to support Tamaulipas as much as possible. And we need to recognize that Tamaulipas, Lower Rio Grande, is really just one production area. And the National Cotton Council recognized that back in 2011 and formed the International Technical Advisory Committee, which Roy mentioned we're both members of. 
And it was really a chance for representatives from Mexico, U.S. to get together, share information, establish communication, what's going on in each program. But we also had our first meeting back in February of 2012. And our first charge was to develop a common protocol, eradication pro protocol for both areas to incorporate. Because it didn't make sense for them to be doing one thing in their program and us. We, we needed to treat that area as one production area. Again, their funding only allows for, uh, on average, four applications. So we, we've got to find some additional ways to get them ULV. APHIS has looked into it. I know National Content Council. Uh, we just got to find ways to uh, supplement their uh, ULV applications. Also, spray equipment. We just sold the Texas program, just sold them two mist blowers, but it took over a year for them to receive it because it got held up at the border by the government and the cartel. So, but they now have access to some modern equipment, spray equipment there. Also, we need to get them to quit, eliminate the use of base sticks and these border ha And in fact, this year they had a meeting. It, well, APHIS held a meeting there, and I believe they finally convinced them to get rid of the bait sticks and these uh, border habitat. Use that money for malathion. Don't waste your malathion in the border habitat. Save it until when you have plants. And this is something I found. I met with Larry Smith uh, last week, and we talked about, well, you know, gosh, they only have 2,800 acres. How easy would it be just to incorporate that into the Texas program? And he said he'd love to do that. But again, getting access to those fields to treat or check traps is going to be a huge problem. Well, what about trap detection failures? Well, for this part, I really want to highlight some of the research we're doing at ARS or have done to, uh, to address this issue. Uh, but first, you know, one maybe the first things we could do is just modify the trap and treatment protocol. Increase trap density on one side of the field. We know with this wind, constant wind, that pheromone plume is very narrow, so you have big gaps in between traps. Uh, maybe we double up or triple up on some size. Uh, we've already started these automatic treatments. If we can't get to that trap, but that field has historically been a problem, well, we're going to go ahead and treat it. Um, again, our data show that we're having very little pheromone coming off that second week, so maybe we need to replace these lures weekly instead of biweekly, uh, or use a lure with a higher dose. Now, I will say these last two options uh, are not economical options, because Grand Lure just went up in cost last year by 35%. So uh, Grand Lure the pheromone is starting to get pretty expensive. Uh, one of the things we did back in 2010 started is a lot of our research has shown that the boll weevil pheromone, well, let me start. Boll weevil pheromones composed of four components, two alcohols and two aldehydes. And the, our research has shown that, that the ratio of those components is about 45, 42, 310 percentage wise. Um, but the commercial granular we use, the ratio is 30, 40, 15. 15. So, so we may not be using the most effective blend to attract weevil story traps. So we got a company. Uh, to make a blend that matches the weevils. Uh, we evaluated it in four areas in Mexico and then two areas here, uh, Atascosa County and Hidalgo County. Uh, I'm just going to present our U.S. data. Basically, if you look at the average number of weevils captured per trap between the experimental and standard blend, it really wasn't a difference. We didn't see them improve in captures. So. Uh, the bottom line is I, I think the weevil responds to a fairly wide blend pheromone. So, I mean, there may be some work to look at different cheaper blends to make uh, because the first component is the most expensive component. Uh, what we did find there in uh, Atascosa, we found another weevil that's highly attracted to that experimental blend, and that's the milkweed stem weevil. Um, it, it may lead to some. Uh, that insect's important for monarch butterfly work because it feeds on milkweeds, which is the host for monarch bird flies. Uh, but it's a problem for trap runners. I mean, we don't want to blend catching other types of weevils because they get confused with boll weevils. So uh, it was actually a negative thing there. One of the things I'm working with now uh, with a company is trying to uh, develop a lure dispenser that actually releases pheromone more uniformly. Uh, instead of having this initial burst that I showed in the earlier slides, we want something that's more steady. Uh, this particular lure we're looking for uh, 
is with the Southeast Eradication Program. They're looking at extending the trapping interval to four weeks and serving those traps every four weeks. Well, the lure they have now only lasts three weeks, so we're looking at building this new lure that will last four weeks. But that technology can also be used for 10 milligrams, where we have uh, good release over just two weeks. So we'll, we'll have some good information by the end of this year on this new prototype. We've, we've looked at about five so far, and the ones we have now look promising. Uh, Daryl, this is a field in Medina County. I don't know if you recognize it or not. Uh, but there's still some work we need to do with modeling pheromone dispersion and relating catchers to surrounding habitat or environmental factors. And what we have here is if you can imagine the wind blowing, and this is the direction of the pheromone plume that's going into the field. Uh, this is uh, the prevailing wind direction for that day or one or more days during the week. Uh, we also, during one, one day or more during that week, the wind blew this way or this way. And these little colored dots indicate uh, captures, weevil captures. The red indicates the highest captures for that week. Uh, the green indicates the lowest, lower captures for that week. And these small dots indicate zero weevils captured in those traps for that week. And, and so what you see is you see this side of the field capturing most of the weevils for that week. Yet here, this side caught very few. And again, it's a little sporadic. Well, we need to figure out why, why are we catching weevils on this side and not this side? What, what's going on? Because if you look, at where the pheromone is going, all the pheromone is not going into the cotton, it's going out of the cotton. These weevils are coming from somewhere else. They're not coming actually from the cotton field, they're coming to the cotton field. Uh, again, here, some of these higher captures, or you see the wind blowing sometimes into this overwintering habitat. So, so we need to look more into the relationships between captures and, and the environmental and uh, physical uh, factors surrounding those traps. Uh, a lot of work was done back with Tom Sappington in that area looking at trap placement. And we now know that if you put a trap next to a brush line, you're likely to catch two to ten times more weevils than you would one out in the open. So for the program, if, you know, they're putting their traps out every tenth of a mile. If they can just move their trap ten feet to get next to a brush line, then that's what needs to be done. Well, this is the last problem, but probably the biggest challenge we have. And as far as providing solutions, uh, I, I think we have to adopt a wide approach, a wide step. First is we've got to educate the land owners and growers. Uh, and this particular flyer is addressed to ranchers and hunters who were feeding cotton seed to their livestock or wildlife. And they were finding a lot of germinated plants uh, out in these pastures, just because they're feeding their livestock and wildlife with uh, cotton seeds. So, so that's an issue. Uh, oftentimes, they don't even know about those plants until the end of the year. All of a sudden, they're catching weevils from some traps, and they start looking around, and, and, and that's what they find. They find these plants. But we also have to provide solutions, and I don't, I don't see Danny in the office here. Um, it's one thing to tell them, hey, you've got problems. You've got volunteer plants in the sorghum field, corn. We've got to be able to tell them how to best get rid of those plants as well. And this was a nice study uh, by Morgan, and I know Danny was involved in it as well. Here's something that's kind of new. They started last year posting these signs in producers' fields for noncompliance. And that's been the biggest challenge. Is in our area before this, around 2010, they were very lenient as far as giving fines for noncompliance. But now they're really cracking down on that in the valley. And they started posting these signs out in the producer's fields. And no producer wants to see this, or he doesn't want his neighbor to see this to show that he's out of compliance. So these signs have been very effective. And in fact, last week I was at the Lower Rio Grande Valley producers meeting and apparently the steering committee, vice president of the steering committee in that area submitted a letter back to TDA in October requesting, I don't know if you can see this, is, the fee is $5 per acre per week that you have hostable plants left in those fields. Well, that letter wanted TDA to increase that to $20 an acre. And then after five weeks, it goes up to 750 
Well, they requested instead of going to 750, they wanted to go to $30 an acre. So they're serious about getting rid of these plants. And what happened last year, you would think, well, no producer wants to pay $5 an acre a week. Uh, but they had this situation where there was a producer who wanted to turn his land into a dove lease. And he wanted to keep his plants in there. So he was willing to pay a $5 assessment fee. And they kept his, kept his plants out in the field for a month. He was willing to pay the $5, but when he got to 750 he thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll get rid of it now. But you have those situations. Even with those fees, you still have producers, well, I haven't harvested in my field yet. I'll, I'll pay the fee. I'll try to get to it by mid-September. So a lot of farms are still willing to pay that fee. So I think this letter, and in fact, at, they held a forum there at the meeting. All six producers that were present voted unanimously to increase that fee from 20 I mean, from five to twenty, and then seven fifty to thirty. So next year, that's probably going to be in the books. We also have to continue and identify or develop techniques to help program uh, find these volunteer plants. And one of the things I've been working on with our engineers over the last few years is is a remote sensing technology, and this is a multispectral. A sensor here I'm holding a hyperspectral and basically we're, we wanted to see if we could use the spectral reflectance of cotton plants to discriminate it from other types of plants uh, and, and it's been somewhat successful but for this to be practical we're going to have to take it to an aerial platform or satellite platform and luckily uh, we have an engineer with tremendous expertise in that area and in fact one of the studies he did he looked at the signature across, I think this is the Hargill, McCook, McCook Hargill area, and he was able to identify each of these field crop types just by the reflectance. And over 90% accurate, in fact, and I think this may play a role, because one of the things the eradication runs into is they'll find a, come across a 40 acre field in July that they didn't even know about, had no traps around, and this technology may be able to uh, help them identify those types of fields. Again, we, we, we want to take this technology now, you know, if we can identify fields, can we actually detect individual plants or sets of plants? Um, we're doing that this year. We started last year. Things look, uh, I don't know, John's been more involved in that area, so if you have any questions regarding that, he may be able to answer that, but things look promising there. We may have something. Uh, to transfer technology-wise in, in a year or two. Um, well, I talked about three. I, I want to wrap up by talking about some additional concerns or future concerns in that area. And one is the development of resistance to malathion. Luckily, we've not had that happen because if we do, we don't have a program anymore. We don't have an effective alternative to malathion. But the last time we checked for resistance was back in 2009, so I'm working with APHIS now, and we're going to look at that this year out of their mission lab at the Moore Air Base. Uh, also, loss of federal funding. Craig and I were just talking about trying to seek federal funding. Well, we're going to lose funding after this year. I don't know if there's anything set. I know we're talking to other states, trying to get funds from them. You know, some of them have agreed, say, yeah, you know, we're not safe until we get rid of the weeds from Texas. But then you have other states, why should we pay for the program in Texas? Uh, so it's been, it's been a challenge there. So, again, secondary pest outbreaks. Let's, let's shut down the program the first year. Uh, hopefully we won't run into that again. Uh, again, I showed at the beginning, we have substantial fluctuates in acreage. If we see a huge jump in acreage, that's going to create a challenge. You've got to get the staff to now trap those areas and maintain those areas. Also, treating a lot more acres, I mean, it's, a, it's going to be a nightmare to treat 100,000 acres versus just having to treat 25,000 acres. Also, there's potential of losing the eradication program in Tamaulipas, uh, and that almost happened last year. They had an applicator had 2,4-D left over in his tank. He sprayed across all the cotton fields and it about killed every plant out there. Uh, 
fortunately, it was at the end of the season. They still got decent yields. But all the producers wanted to get out of the program right then. Uh, they kind of convinced them to stick with it. It wouldn't happen again. And, and so, but if that happens, that's, that's going to pose a big problem for us. And as always, the tropical storm issues. Uh, every time we make progress, you know, back in 2009, we made great progress in 2009, but then 2010, we had Alex come in, Hermine, and that just set back the program a whole year or two. So everything they gained up to 2009, they lost. Uh, with that, I'll end. I'd like to acknowledge these individuals and, and groups and welcome any questions. Let me see if there's any remote questions. Yes, uh, you see down there in the toolbar, you got a little L. Does it have a little orange thing around it? Go ahead and click on that. Well, something happened here, Pete. Okay, hang on. I'll be right there. Toolbar. While we're waiting on Pete, I do have one question. Uh, Charles, the uh, cost of detection of plants, John, is there any any idea on what this might cost to detect uh, unwanted plants in, either in other crops or growing up any place, really? Well, you're looking at about, you can plan on about $100, uh, 300 uh, yeah, I figured about $300 for a flight for over an hour to cover. Uh, but you can cover a lot of area in, in one hour. And as far as the cost of detection, well, you just have to have someone that's willing to go through those uh, images and, and process them. But once we develop the model, uh, all we have to do is scan the image, and it's going to predict what's cotton and what's not. So the, the major cost, and, and what we thought about in the future is, well, maybe we could team up these remote sensing missions with some of these aerial applicators that are already up in the area anyway or flying around. And, may, and maybe, the, you know, th this could be an extra source of income for those guys to, to actually make those flights for the program and, and take those images. Uh, as far as the processing costs, I don't know, John, you may have a better idea. And, and you know, ultimately we can look at some satellite, but I, I don't think the resolution is going to be great enough. Uh, we can certainly detect fills with the satellite images, uh, but getting real-time access to the satellite images is a challenge. Doctor, you need to work on some more sensing stuff. Like that, you showed that little cotton where it was along the, of the flow low or the floodway. Was that the water line? Right. Can, can you all detect that kind of that kind of row of plants there? Yeah, we, we, the given size, we'd be able to take the individual plants. What about, let's say, down along that water there, where the brush is pretty thick, and you even go down to the, the refuge down there that's only a couple of days? Normally, we don't see plants there, but on a storm event, you could have seed washing down the plant very easily. Let me repeat that question. So, so Craig was asking whether we we could use that remote sensor. It's kind of long, so let me sort of try to shorten it up to detect these smaller plants that may be hidden inside other types of brush. Is that correct? Is that pretty much the gist? And one and one thing about I'll turn it over to John because this has been his area. Now he's working on now is is not just looking at the spectral reflectance of those plants, but we also have some analyses to look at the shape of that brush, the shadow produced. To Because if you look at the image, it's hard to tell. Is that a cotton plant this tall? Or is it mixed in with some other brush? And that's one of the things we're looking at now, some other spatial analysis. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is John Westbrook. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is uh, high, resolu high spatial resolution, multispectral airborne images. 
we have a pixel resolution of about uh, 10 centimeters, so just about four inches. Uh, and uh, what we're doing, we uh, actually analyze the spatial distribution of the reflectance in each of those pixels, say within about uh, one meter or so, and so that we can detect different sizes of plants and then the shape, as Charles was inferring, one of the things we're currently uh, working on is looking at uh, shading. In other words, shade cast by these plants and use that to determine uh, height and width of the, uh, the plants. Uh, our test bed is a field plot in College Station where we had a, a very weedy field and then we had regrowth plants. Some were large plants, some were, were maybe only uh, 20 centimeters across, some were maybe 50 centimeters across. But just based on the spectral reflectance, often you couldn't tell any difference from uh, spurge, spotted spurge, turnip weed, all these, and cotton. But if we then added the, uh, this physical feature, such as the three-dimensional structure of the plant, as estimated from a, an airborne image, then we can start to reduce the amount of false positives uh, detected by this. So this is exactly where we are right at this moment, and we're looking at various spatial analysis features to uh, find out more detail about how the reflectance is distributed uh, from that from the various plants. So we may be able to do that, say, along uh, an arroyo uh, brush that might be leafing out and might look like it has the same characteristics of reflectance as cotton, but it may have other features that are very different uh, when you look at a cluster of, of adjacent pixels. So that's what that's the way we're currently looking at that. So, and I'll add to that, Craig, that you know, even though these other types of weeds may be tough to distinguish, but in the case of volunteer plants and corn or milo, we, we, we can do that. The plants are large enough over, you know, I don't know, at a thousand uh, feet altitude, we're looking at 0.1 meter. Rest. So, I mean, over if plants are about, I don't know, foot foot wide, maybe we could we we can detect those. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't see them from the road or through the roads, but the only way you'll be able to see them is from above. And I, I think we could detect those now. Uh, no. There's a total of 87 captured around commercial fields versus uh, these numbers are way down. Yeah, they're way down. Uh, right. Uh, well, all right, let me repeat that. Darwin was asking about the numbers of weevils captured from January to April. 30th and how those in 2013 related to previous years and I indicated there were only 87 weevils captured in these commercial cotton fields uh, which is way down from the previous years. Uh, he also indicated how did these trapping the corners of uh, previous planted cotton fields help and, and if you'll recall what they do is they plant when, when they have cotton in a field and they harvest and they come back next year with, let's say, corn and you have volunteer, well, whether you have volunteer or not, if, if they know that field was planted in cotton the previous year, they place traps in each corner. Now, if they start to see volunteer plants, they actually trap it like it was a cotton field. And in fact, they're cap, you know, I don't know if you remember the number, there's over 1,100 weevils captured in these non-commercial cotton fields versus the 87 in their actual commercial cotton fields. Yeah, yes, back in 2000. That's what brought us to the success we've got today. One of the most striking fields up there about two years ago was a pilot field, right? Yeah. It wasn't a market cotton. Sorry. Can you tell us what's going to happen? What kind of effect is going to have a program like we had that? Program we had last year, where hundreds of papers were, uh, you know, with uh, 300, 400 bundles of cotton were plowing the air into the ground and uh, were forcing the rain. But uh, when you 
Well, so 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 the question is basically if if we, if we have cotton from the previous year, let me get this straight, and and then all of that's three. Three or four hundred, and they just destroy. It. Don't even try to harvest it. Um, what kind of scenario is that going to play for the eradication the next year? Uh, th that was brought up at our CPAC meeting because it's been so dry this year. Uh, the, the the best thing we could have happen though is to have one huge rain event and, and to get all the seeds germinated at one time, as opposed to a little shower here that germinates ten percent of the seeds and. And then you have to get rid of it, and and if you can do it early enough, and if the germination happens early enough in the season when your other crops are smaller, you can detect them, you can get rid of them a lot easier. Once these plants get bigger, I mean, we do have effective herbicides. You know, most of this is Roundup ready cotton, so you can't just go back. You you've got to find something that's labeled for that crop as well. But you have to treat those cotton plants when they're small. That's about the only way to actually kill them. So. It's going to have a tremendous, and the, the rain, I mean, we got rain last week down there. You guys got some rain. Uh, we'll, we'll see what that does as far as germinating all these seeds that have been dormant this winter. Darling. In the valley, of, with the, the weevil lead, let's say the percentage of the population in the neighborhood of the Another population does not fall. If the not fall, it's going to be extended or shorter. So, so Darren's question was, you know, has anyone looked at, you know, the percentage of these weevils in the lower Rio Grande that actually go into diapause uh, versus, uh, you know, remaining active year round, and and how does that impact the eradication program? And there's been a lot of work done down in the valley about diapause, and there's still great debate now what triggers diapause. A lot of our research shows it's based on food. It's not the, not the short day periods as you go from 11 to 13. It's what they feed on. And if you feed these weevils bowls, they start to fatten up. And whether, you know, there's great debate now whether it's even a true diapause. I mean, uh, I mean, I can fatten up weevils any time of the year. You give me some bowls, I'll, I'll fatten them up, and, and, and whether they're in diapause or not, I can I can take them off food, and they'll survive six months just fine. So that is the issue that's going on down the valley. So not only do you have reproduction going on year-round fish, now you've got all these volunteer plants and regrowth for them to reproduce on all, but you have a population that's going into diapause. So even if you got rid of these weevils, active weevils, all of a sudden you've got these other weevils coming back the next spring. Uh, what that percentage is, we don't know. But we know some fatten up and go into diapause, others remain active year-round. All right, well, go ahead, Mike. Trump, um, I'm going to ask you questions from the remote because I thought um, we're all going away by having the temperature studies for the I think you showed we're between 75 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. He was worrying about how does the worst of the above 90 degrees. Those temperatures that you do see in the real world. Yeah, and in fact, uh, I don't know if you remember, but the, one of the slides I showed of our field agent study, the actual average daily temperature was 89, and, and we were dealing with 105, 110 degrees max. And so we were dealing, yeah, it's true. Those. And that's a good point, key point, because you have to remember when these lures were developed, they were developed for weevils in a temperate region, North Carolina, Georgia. Uh, we haven't changed that, but yet now we're in a subtropical environment, and we know that has a huge influence on the rate of pheromone. And that's some of the things we may have to modify and change. We can't just say we're going to use this lure we've used for 30 years. It may not be appropriate for, for that environmental condition. And in fact, I will say, not only is temperature important, we're starting to think the uh, UV light ray has something to do on those dispensers and, and the emission of uh, pheromone because we can take lures and hold them at a constant 85 degrees versus hold them outside at a similar, we, we lose a lot more out, outside than we do 
inside. And because you have other factors, you have uh, UV radiation, you have other things going on, wind, uh, humidity. It's not just temperature driven. Uh, but yeah, I think we need to look at some other, you know, not be one mind and say, oh, we're just going to continue using this lure. And one more I thought was intriguing. We talked about the lure placement. Some of those lures we get closer to vegetation brush. Right. And then there's one question. How about wooded areas? So we see the same effect along wooded areas. Um, one of the things, anytime you have any prominent vegetation, whether it's wood, brush line, mesquite tree, a single mesquite tree, you, you, that wind, that particular uh, brush line or wood it creates a windbreak and now weevils can actually fly I mean you, you've got 20 miles an hour winds these weevils I mean to hit a pheromone trap you know in 20 miles an hour wind or even if they even fly at 20 miles an hour is debatable uh, and then once they miss that trap they're gone uh, but when you have a trap along the wooded edge and that wind speeds down to five miles per hour, it's a lot easier for those weevils to actually hit that trap, find that trap. And oftentimes, if you ever do a trap study and, and you look at putting a, and you have a lot of weevils, look at the surrounding veg, vegetation, you'll be amazed how many weevils there are around that trap. Uh, Dr. So and just landed and are sitting there. And, and being that close to the trap, they may be able to go, I don't know if you guys paid attention to the color of the pheromone trap. It's, it's, it's that color for two reasons. One is weevils are attracted to that color, but more so it's easier for the eradication folks to actually see it when they run it. So, but there is a reason that, that color uh, for that color. Yeah, Dr. Sewell, you have a question from Brad Cowan. Uh, Brad, go ahead. Uh, yes, I was wondering if uh, there's been any studies uh, where you do trapping all the way around brushy areas that are adjacent to cotton fields. Yeah, we we there's been several studies done. In fact, we did, we had one in our uh, production area, of the southern blacklands, and what we tended to see is, you know, we were looking at putting traps actually away from cotton fields. Uh huh. And you know, our thought was, you know, when you put a trap next to a cotton field, especially during the spring, mm -hmm. these, these weevils are coming out of their over, you're bringing weevils to your field. And our thought was, well, what if we put the trap no. 10, 50 meters away from the cotton field, where if it missed the trap, we weren't giving it a cotton field right there to land on. Uh, so we, we do have some studies, and uh, I'll be glad to share those with you, the information we gleaned from that study. Um, we got a couple belt-wise out of those, I believe. Well, then if that's the case, what they're saying about the brush, then should they put pheromone traps all along in yeah. the two wildlife refuges that we have? Did you get that? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What about the wildlife refuge? Where, where, where trap places would it be? Would it be, it would be in heaven and just put some traps away from the top of the surrounding wildlife refuge? In, in fact, our trapping line study that you joined me on that one day, we did that. That was a wildlife area there. And, and that's the point. When we do these trapping studies, uh, and we are dealing with low population, we, we, we always put our traps next to the brush line. And because we know we're going to capture more weevils. You're going to get a lot of zeros if you put them out in the open. And so we always, and in fact, the study I had, the experimental lure, when we were, uh, I, I actually traveled into the three areas of Mexico to help set them up, but in Tamaulipas, uh, Carlos Campos set those up, but I requested that he put those specifically along a brush line and he gave me a KMZ file, I looked at Google and I, I pointed out, hey, if you can put them along this brush line here and he did those. So I, I will say this, Craig, I don't know if you remember this, and Roy, you probably remember this, when they provided their numbers showing they averaged about three weevils per trap per week and the first week I had my trapping study there, I caught over se average 700 weevils per trap. All right, one more question. Uh, excellent presentation, and everything seems to point out that uh, we've got some 
lower end. So that it seems to point out to me that uh, that the long term solution is that is that the ball we will persist up for the <laughs> there, there there has so the question was, you know, we we've got a lot of problems out here and um to complete eradication, and so what? What about a boll weevil resistant variety, or transgenic? Um, and I've talked to some folks at Monsanto about this, and they felt, yeah, we could probably develop something, but there's no money in it for them. That's a one-time solution. We kill the weevil, then what do we do? Well, that and that's Charles Allen's big push right now. He he is really pushing. To if some company doesn't want to take that lead, he feels they have the tools there on campus, the breeders, genetics folks, to to do it themselves, to actually come up with a variety. And may I ask why? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not in this meeting, but we'll we'll, we'll certainly talk about that. But yeah, there there has been talks of that, obviously, of of creating a uh, variety. Uh, uh, I think this is the time to push for that. Well, I, I know boll weevil is becoming a problem in Argentina, Brazil. So it's becoming a huge problem now. So you're not just talking about a U.S. market or Mexico market. You're talking about a global market. So, um, but as with ARS, we're talking U.S. Production. So uh, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, we had we had um, um, Pete. We're gonna have to wrap up now. Uh, okay. Well, we got one, one, two more quick questions from the remote audience. And one is: the temperature slides for lures were shown at 75 and 85 Fahrenheit. However, in the valley, we have temperature above 90, so the duration of lures may not be accurate. Uh, yeah, I, I, I sort of address that. We we do have some data that for uh, those higher temperatures, and, and that, that that is a fact. It, you know, obviously we can't simulate the conditions uh, that you have in the valley where we were, but we did have some temperatures over 100 degrees. Uh, and obviously, I think it's you're going to see even a more initial burst down here in the valley. So I think it's even more important to get find a lure that releases pheromone more uniformly over that two-week period. Okay, I guess the final question is, instead of using satellite imaging, can John or Charles ever thought of using drones? <laughs> Very good question. I'll have to call Obama on that one, see, see if I borrow one. But uh, uh, certainly, we've talked about that. In fact, when uh, Greg Sword first came aboard, he had done some work on using some of these um, little model airplanes, for better lack of term, or drones for that matter, to image, take some of these images. The, the issue we would run into is some of our equipment, we need a fairly good sized drone to do that, or a remote plane to do that with, but certainly that's a possibility.